Amen, good afternoon, barely. Hi guys, this is awesome. It's so good to be back in, uh, in the house of God together. I know I'm a little bit late to the game. Um, each, each and every Sunday, uh, I've been with my daughter, Emberly. she's two, so I haven't had the privilege and the blessing of being back in church with you guys. Um, but as things start moving forward, I'm excited to be in person with you. However, I'm here today. Aren't you guys excited about it? I know you are. You don't have to, don't flatter me, you're so kind. <laughs> No, in all reality, you guys, my name is uh, Nikki Garcia. I'm associate campus pastor here along with my husband, Ricky Garcia. And I just have to say, first and foremost, welcome to those of you watching online. If you're in your homes, aren't we so thankful that the Holy Spirit is not a respecter of technologies, nor a building, nor a boundary, nor walls, nothing like that. I'm so expectant for the word that the Lord is gonna bring to you guys today through me. And I know that it's a powerful one because it's been powerful in my life. But I wanna tell you something about this church if you don't know it. Listen, today is the fifth week back, the fifth Sunday back since we've um, reopened you know, the, the physical church for the uh, second time. So much has happened in, in these four weeks. So much growth is occurring in you guys. You guys are hungry for the word of God. We've now had to go back to the two services, which is awesome. It's such a good thing. You know that, obviously. You're in the second service. So this isn't new information to you, but I say this to tell you this thing. God is moving here. He's always on the move, right? Always. He has good things planned for this church, for this city, for this nation, for this world. And I believe that we're looking up, uh, we're, we're gonna walk into a time where um, the Holy Spirit is gonna present himself in a way that we might not have experienced before. I think that the world is getting to a place where the power of God will be made evident and known, so much so to the extent where it's gonna be undeniable. Amen? So. I'm excited for that. I'm excited to go through it with you guys. And so as we move in that direction, let's go ahead and pray as we get into the first scripture of today's message. Father, I thank you again for your work and for your word, Lord. I thank you that you've given us the privilege and the honor that it is in America to be able to physically hold a Bible, to read it off of those pages. God, we know that there's nothing supernatural about a book, but we know that the author is supernatural. Father, the words that the Bible holds it's not just ink on a page, but it's literal life to our bones in Jesus' name. It's the lifeblood that runs through us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here now. We say that we need you, we depend on you. We pray for the rest of this service that it would be Holy Spirit led. God, we don't want to come to church and just learn about people. We wanna to come to church and get brought closer to you so that we might walk out of this church and the message that we learned today would be transform, like transformation power, not just for Sunday, but for the rest of the week and for the rest of our lives. Thank you for peace in this place, for every single person who's in here. Soften their hearts and open their ears in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, there is um, a group of people in the Bible that I want to talk about. You've probably heard of them frequently. If you have, that's a good thing. They're written about frequently, so it just means that maybe you've been listening to messages or reading the Word of God. If you've not heard the name of these people, then this might be the first time that you're learning a little bit more about them, and that's great too, because he, here's, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, the first five books, we learn a lot about a people group called the Israelites. If that's familiar to you, raise your hand so I know where everybody's at. You've heard of the story of the Israelites. Um, if you've not, Man, their story is awesome. It's, when people say the Bible's boring, I'm like, we are not writing, we're not reading the same Bible. The Bible is not boring. There's crazy stuff that happens, it's awesome. But in the first five books of the Bible, um, namely, those, those chapters really focus in on the Israelite people, the nation of Israel. And the reason that that's the case is because these people, the scripture says, are God's chosen people. Now, um, the reason that they're God's chosen people is not because he doesn't choose other, other people, he loves all people, but something was really, really special about this specific group of people. And that really special thing was that Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, would come through this lineage of people. So wouldn't you guys agree that they're pretty important? They're, they're a pretty important group of people. Now, not only were they important in the Old Testament times while it was happening, but they are so important for us as believers today. And Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 10. Let's read the first six verses. 1 Corinthians 10 verses one through six. He says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the cloud and all went through the sea. They were all baptized as followers of Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But God was not pleased with most of them. So they died in the desert. Verse six says, as these things happened as examples for us to stop wanting evil things as those people did. So there's a lot kind of happening in this passage, but really what I wanna focus in on is two things, two things, and we're gonna start backwards. Verse six says this, Paul says, hey, the Israelite people went through things and not all of them were good. They saw God's amazing power. They went through a lot of really great, powerful things, but there were parts of their story that we don't want to repeat themselves. He says, let's not have history repeat themselves in specific parts, which is the part that we're gonna talk about today. However, in verse five, he says that some people died in the desert. We'll get into that in a little bit, but I, I believe that the reason Paul tells us that the Israelites, um, the Israelite story is examples for us today is kind of the same idea for football. How many of you guys are excited that football season starts today? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, hey Cowboys, that's, that's how I know. Ricky, my husband, he loves football. Very excited um, for the Cowboys, very excited. They have a, a really good um, amount of opportunity to improve, you know? So, which we, we're, we're praying for them. But Paul says, I want you guys to look back on the Israelites' history and use, this, use them as an example of what not to do. So it's kind of like in football. I have a feeling that this season, the Cowboys are gonna sit down a lot after they play and look at things not to do from maybe the most previous game that they played. But I, I believe in them. I think that they're gonna do great after they learn what not to do, you know? But there might be a couple of plays or two in that game that they need to focus in on and say, okay, you did a, a lot of good things that good football things happen. I sound really, <laughs> I love football. But I have a feeling they're gonna be able to hone in on a lot of areas to say, okay, you see this example? We don't want to do that next time. Let's just make it a goal not to do that thing there, you know? And, and, and so it's the same way for the Israelites. They were such an important part of our spiritual ancestry and the story that we read that's in the Bible. However, it's so applicable in our lives today for us to kind of zoom, zoom in and hone in on the part of the play that we don't want to repeat. We don't want to repeat it, okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Israelite journey can be a long one if you read it in detail, and the goal is not even to read it in detail, but there are a lot of similarities between us and the Israelites, a lot of similarities. Are we not God's chosen people? Did he not look at us and desire that we would come to him, that we would be reconciled with him? Yes. Did he not, just the same way that the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt, that happened in, in part of their history, they, they were held as slaves at one point. They felt the physical effects of what it meant to be a slave the emotional effect of what it meant to be a slave. They didn't have control over their life. They had to listen to a slave driver. They lived their life in slavery, yet they saw the power of God move on their behalf when they were taken out of slavery. Praise God, have we not been taken, Galatians 4, 7, out of slavery and into sonship of God right through Jesus Christ? Have, has that not happened for us? And then another part in their history is that they went through the wilderness time, which we've heard a lot of messages and a lot of teaching about that wilderness um, period and portion, and it's super valuable, but the Israelites were not meant to be in that wilderness period for as long as they were. We know that, you know, and that wilderness period in our lives as believers today is after we've gotten saved, after we're free from sin, we are meant to walk in the promises that God has set before us. When he looked at you, when he created you, he knew exactly what he would gift and call you to do. First and foremost, he wants everybody to be saved. It's his will that everybody be saved, right? We were free from sin. These good things happen. So I, I want us to be, I want to say something about the Israelites. There were two generations that we learn about. In the book of Numbers, um, a census was taken twice. And it's not because they miscounted the first time, not at all. It's because the first time they counted, it was one generation of Israelites, and the second time they counted was a completely different generation of Israelites. And it's not because um, 
that was necessarily meant to happen, but the reality of it is this. The first gen generation of Israelites who had experienced slavery and then freedom, and then they saw God's power as he provided for them in the wilderness, and they heard about the promised land that God had promised to them. He says, I have set for you in your future, this is gonna happen. You're gonna walk into a, to a land flowing with milk and honey. It's gonna be a good land of rest and promises fulfilled for you. You're gonna go, you're gonna abide there. My eye is gonna be on watch over the land. And I love the word that um, the original Greek means for flowing, means literally gushing. At one point, they lived in a land that was not fertile. We see a lot of um, natural kind of like natural physical things in the Old Testament that represent spiritual things for us today. And that land flowing with milk and honey, what that means for believers today is, eventually we will, yes, we will be in heaven. We will spend eternity in heaven if you're saved. However, for this life, while we do so, once we've been saved, there is a type of victory, promise, rest, fulfillment, good things, a land flowing with milk and honey, so to speak, that God has meant for us as believers to walk into. Do you know it's not normal? It, it's not, I don't want to say normal, I need to be careful. It's not intended that Christians remain slaves to fear, to anxiety, to sickness, to uh, uh, sorrow, to disrest. We are not meant to simply be spiritually free, but to remain in, in, in like a physical bondage for the entire lives here. Because you know this. Ephesians 1.3, we don't have to pull that up right now, um, people in the back, but Ephesians 1.3 says, Paul's writing again, he says, praise be to the God Father who has, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that we have in Christ Jesus. So when we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, there are things that we inherit because we've been free from um, slavery, adopted into the kingdom of God, we now inherit the good things that God has blessed us. Uh, later on, in a couple of verses down, Paul talks about those good things. He talks about sonship, that we're no longer orphaned, that we have a father God, our God, the father, the creator of the universe, calls us son and daughter. I want to talk about the fact that, the reality, that I have personally seen, and maybe this is you, maybe you're experiencing it. I have seen people accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, come to church, Maybe they get a glimpse of the things that God's promised them. They get saved, yet they kind of remain in that wilderness wandering portion for longer than is intended for them. See, just like the Israelites, that first generation, they were not meant to live in the wilderness forever. God wanted them to enter into the promised land that he had given to them. So what happened? What, what play do we need to zoom in on so that we don't repeat, because the fact is this, that entire first generation died out. That's what 1 Corinthians 10, verse five was talking about. You don't have to pull that up, but if you wanna look it up, you can. He says, this is why people died in the wilderness. An entire new generation was the one who eventually did walk into the promised land, but it wasn't the, the first generation, it was the second generation. I wanna read to you in Deuteronomy, we'll start with one verse, uh, Deuteronomy chapter one, verse eight. This is Moses reminding the people of the promise that God's given before them. He says, um, see, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. He says two things here, and that's why the title, I guess I should tell you the title of my message, A plus for me today. The title of today's message is called The Paradox of the Promise, and I wanna tell you why. It comes from this verse. If you don't know what a paradox is, a paradox is something that sounds like it could be opposite to each other, when in reality, it, it work, it, it's um, meant to bring truth to the fact of what it's talking about. For example, a scripture is full of, of, of paradox, uh, paradoxical phrases, like the first shall be last right? And, and I mean, so on and so forth. You can name the rest. But the paradox that the first generation of Israelites were experiencing had to do with the promise that God gave him. We can pull that scripture up again. There's two parts to it. Deuteronomy 1 verse 8 says, see, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the, worst, the, of the land 
the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to the descendants after them. So let me ask you this. If a paradox talks of two things that are opposite to each other, yet it still remains true, what's the opposite of to give? What's the opposite of to give? To take. So why would God, why would God say, I can imagine the Israelites being like, okay, so you're giving us something, but you also want us to take that something. Which one is it? You're giving or are we taking? And God's like, yes. <laughs> to that I say, yes. It's a paradox. One has to happen. One can't happen without the other. For them, the land that God was saying that they would go in and possess had two parties involved. One, that God would give them the land, that he would set out the land, and that he would be faithful to do what he would say in that land, right? How many, of you guys know, how many of you guys know God does not lie? He's not a liar. But it meant that they had to put action behind their faith if they were going to walk in and take possession or walk into that land so that they could see the, the promise of God fulfilled in their life. This is what the first gener generation of Israelites failed to do. I want to tell you why. They had what I'm calling today grasshopper syndrome. You're like, oh, that's good. No, it's not good. Grasshopper syndrome. You see, Moses had told the people about what God shared with him. Moses was the one leading the first generation of Israelites, and he had spoken to them about the land that God was going to hand to them, that it was a land flowing of milk and honey. He talked to them about how they would experience um, the very opposite of what they experienced in slavery. He gave them specifics, which you can go back and read about. It's really interesting if you're to look further into it. And when that happened... Actually, um, Moses sent people from the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan to go and scope out the land, to spy out and to kind of like take a peek, literally spy, in the land that God said he was going to give them. Now, this is what we have to understand. These spies that were appointed to go out into the land were not just a group of men that like volunteered. It wasn't like that, you know, they didn't volunteer to go and to, to spy out the land. These men were trained these men were knowledgeable. These men knew what to look for. These men were given a report that they were supposed to check on, and I want to tell you about what that report is. But these men were very intentionally picked out in order to be the ones to go and to spy out the land. And in fact, there were 12 men, 12 tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. I want to read to you. This is not going to come up on the screen because it's a little bit, um, it would be a lot for you to read. But I want to tell you, Moses is telling the spies this. It's in Numbers, the 13th chapter, verses 18 to 20. He says, go and see what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back the, uh, the sample of the crops that you see. And then scripture says, it happened to be season of harvesting the first ripe grapes. Which is a cool fact. But what Moses was saying, and we need to get this picture. Let's put ourselves into this picture. You're Moses. God already told you that you were to lead people into a land flowing with milk and honey. Did God not already give you a report of the land that he was calling you to? What did he say? Flowing with milk and honey. It was actually, it can be used as a type of symbolism to um, symbolize rest, that they didn't have to work uh, to live anymore, that God would be their provider, he would provide for them, that they would be able to experience the goodness of God. So Moses was already given a report by God about this land. It's interesting that he would have to send human eyes to tell him something that God already told him. Interesting, right? So what happens is they spend 40 days and 40 nights in the land of Canaan, and keep in mind, they weren't living freely in this land. Again, they were like spies. So they, I'm sure that they had to be undercover and they had to go through things. They were looking at a, a strategical way to kind of overcome and conquer this land because remember, they were living in a time uh, where the military was very prominent because conquering a land meant going to battle and, and overcoming, conquering the people who lived in the land. We have to keep in mind, they weren't just marching there and asking for keys. They had to go and take it by force, right? And so... 40 days and 40 nights pass, they come back and they finally have the report of the land. Remember, Moses gave them a checklist. This happens in the 30th verse, Numbers 13, excuse me, the 31st verse. He says, then the men who had gone up with him said, I'm sorry, 
Verse 27, and they told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Interesting that something God said was true, huh? Funny how that works, right? He said, it was flowing with milk and honey. However, this is a really dangerous word to use as a Christian. When you have seen the promises of God, and when you've read something in scripture that is yours in Jesus' name because of what you inherited when you became saved, if it's a, I don't want to get ahead of myself, if this is a spiritual blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3, we already read it, it's said, it's spoken, that we have spiritual blessings in Christ, who are we and what condition of our heart has to happen in order for us to Judge what God said based off of what we see and count his word as false and the circumstances true. It's big. That's big, right? This is what they were doing. So they said, verse 28, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. There were giants in the land. They were a part of the Nephilim. You can go and read about it. It's, it's, we don't have time to get into it today. But the people were physically really, really huge. There were giants in the land. Now, out of the 12 spies, 10 came back with a report that said, yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey. However, there are people in the land and we're probably gonna be devoured by them. They have what's called grasshopper syndrome, and I'll tell you why. You can pull uh, this one up if we have it so they can see the word grasshopper. Numbers 13.33. This is after they had given up the evil report. And there we saw the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. We seemed ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So really what happened was they were seeing two things. In the, in the physical, this wasn't even something that they had to like activate in the spirit realm. This was in the physical. Two things. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. They literally brought some of its crops back. Scripture says that they had to have two men carry the, the cluster of grapes that they got from the crops because the soil was so rich and so good. It was a land flowing of milk and honey. There was no lack there in that regard. They have proof that God's word was true. Yet up against the giants, it made them see themselves as grasshoppers, small, small. Now, I, I want to, I wanna, not that I want to give them some credit, but I want to take this back to us guys. I wanna bring this back home here. A lot of us know what it's like to live as a slave to sin. A lot of us know what it's like to be bound by lust and to have that thing come and try to destroy our family, that giant. A lot of us know what it's like to battle with anxiety, fear, depression. A lot of us know what it feels like to be a slave, you see. Just like they knew, they felt the physical effects of slavery. They knew that. But the, God's promise, he had, there was proof of the promise in the land. Yet they were so overtaken and consumed by what they saw in the natural that they discounted and discredited what God had told them was theirs in the spiritual realm and in the, in the physical realm. How many of us have lived our lives with grasshopper syndrome in our walk with Christ? How many of us, and this is a, I mean, thank you for your honesty. I love, I, hey, there's no shame here. We're getting free. We're getting out of that mentality. You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. Just like there was a paradox to the promise that God sent for them, that God was giving them the promised land, but they had to go and to take possession Two of the spies out of the 12 were the only ones that came back with a good report. They tried to tell the people, hey, the land is flowing with milk and honey. They were so excited about the, the, the fact that they knew that God was faithful. Like, he's like, that land that's been talked up for I don't know how long, it actually exists and it can be our reality. Let's go take it. God is with us. That's all we need. The giant, yeah, we saw the same giants that the other 10 saw. 
But the thing is, I'm not focused on that. I am more focused on what the word of God says than what the giants threaten. Amen? For us. Listen. Gosh, they had, in the book of Romans, the, th the, the, third, uh, the third chapter, there's a scripture that says, make God true and every man a liar. What does that mean? That means that whatever tries to set itself up against the power of God, we have to see as a lie. And the word of God as truth. They had a Romans 3 spirit about them, Joshua and Caleb did. They saw the same giants. They saw the same land. They saw the same fortified city. They saw the same everything, yet their report was different because they clung to every word that God spoke. You guys in this room, you guys are about to walk back out of this room and face some real giants in the land, huh? You guys are about to know what it's like to believe in the promise that God has for you and activate your faith and walk into it yet face some giants. I wanna tell you what God said to Joshua. He said, every single place that your foot should tread will be yours. And we can pull that scripture up because this is really important in our application as we kind of come in the direction of what do we do with this information? Moses, my servant, is dead. This is Joshua 1, verses 2 and 3. Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. The promise was there. What was the possessing part? The possessing part meant that if Joshua was gonna be successful in leading the second generation of Israelites into the promised land, there had to be action on his part. James 2.17 says that faith without action is dead. For us, I wanna, uh, man, for us, every place that the sole of our foot would tread will be given to us because we are strong and courageous just as God, as God told Joshua to be. But for our foot to tread in places they've never treaded before, requires action on our part to take steps boldly into the places that we've never come up before for the fear of the giants in the land. When you make a choice to, to abandon the grasshopper syndrome and have a Romans 3 spirit to make, to make every man a liar and God be the truth, you're gonna have to go places in the spirit you've never been willing to go before. You're gonna have to come up to giants that in the past as a grasshopper you might've shied from. You're gonna have to do things and say things to people, come up against opposition. Yet you know that you are not trying to snatch something that doesn't belong to you. You're simply taking possession of the things that do belong to you. I wanna paint this in a really, really practical way and then make it, I mean, I feel like we've been talking about that, but it would be wrong to not tell you about something that I'm presently doing, and this is very practical, okay? I wanna show a picture of my two-year-old giant on the screen. Emberly Rose, she'll come up here in a, on the screen in a minute. She's cute, but she's a giant, let me tell you. The book of Proverbs, the second chapter, says that if you train up a child in the way that they should go, that they will never depart from, their path, from that path. Other translations say, um, if you train them in their youth, then when they're old, they will come back to the path. It depends on the translation that you, that you read. But the reason that I just wanna highlight this part of my life to you right now, and some of you are like, She's two, wait till she's, till she's 14, I know, give me a break. Maybe you can give me some pointers. This is my giant right now. <laughs> but this is the thing, the terrific twos, terrific I'm saying by faith, the terrific twos are real. This chick threw a candle in a glass vase at my face a few days ago. It didn't feel good, it hurt. If I'm believing for her life what the Lord has spoken to me in the spirit about her life, I gotta do some work right now. And when the, the promise is fulfilled, when she gets saved, when she's able to make that choice, when she honors God with her lips because of the example that she's seen in our home, when she speaks and people get saved, when she proclaims the goodness of God and others' faith is built up, when those promises are fulfilled, one, it's gonna be because, because those, are, those things are legally mine in the scripture. I'm, possess, I'm just taking what's already got my name on it. However, the paradox is that the possessing I do today will go in the direction of the promise fulfilled tomorrow. Right? 
this comes all the way back down to very simply the words that I speak to my daughter right now when she's two. How I respond to her right now when she's two. Her tantrums. Am I letting them cower me away from truly disciplining her the way that I believe that the Lord has asked me to discipline her? I get it, she's only two. We're talking about a two-year-old. Let's take this into your marriage. What has God said is legally yours in the union between a man and a woman? That they shall be one, but they're also the representation of God with his bride. That it's a picture of the relationship that God has with his people, right? That it represents forgiveness and unity and beauty and power. Man, because when a marriage is healthy and you're both after the things of God, there's nothing you can't do when you're united in Christ, right? And I mean, I mean taking things for the kingdom. Don't, take my, don't twist my words. I'm not saying you'll go and, and make a lot of money and that's what we're after. I'm talking about the peace that comes with both being in the will of God. Money's great, but it's not everything. Peace of God. You can have all the money in the world and never have peace. And you can have the peace of God and never have a, you know, not have a cent to spare. The peace of God is what we're after. You guys are... Ex- but what does possessing that promise in your marriage look like for you right now? Does it look like coming up against bitterness, the giant bitterness? Does it look like coming up against the giant that held a grudge because of something that was done on the other party's part? What, what, what do those giants look like for you? Your adult children, that they would be saved in Jesus' name. That they would not, that, man, that they would not have to deal with the destruction that maybe you dealt with in your youth. What does that mean? You possessing the promise for them today, the amount of time that you spend in prayer on your knees, declaring the blood of Jesus over their life. The possession today leads in the direction of the promise tomorrow. Right? Now I want you to just have this moment. Think about it. As we wrap up, there's, I wish that, I really, really wish that we had more time, um, that we had more time together, but I want to encourage you in this. James 2, 7 says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Here's what we need to do, family. This is what we need to do. There there are promises in the spirit that already belong to you in the spiritual, but you might not have them in your hands necessarily in the natural. So what do you do? You find out what's legally yours. What's written in scripture? What has God promised? What is he bound to? He is bound to his word, right? You find that whatever lack you have in your life and you want the will of God to come in your life in that particular area because you know it's the will of God, find out what the scripture says is legally yours. Then once you know that, you gotta see if you have grasshopper syndrome or if you live in the spirit of Romans 3 just like Joshua and Caleb did to make God true and every other man a liar. After you know that, you've got a James 2.17, put faith behind, action behind your faith Walk in the areas that the soles of your feet may have never tread before. Be strong and courageous the way that God told Joshua. Watch God honor his word in your life because you're making a choice to possess the promises that he has for you. Watch that happen. And then I want you to notice something. I'm not saying that everything in your life has to be comfortable, nothing like that. Notice I never talked about material possessions. I talked about the spiritual blessings that the Bible says are yours you'll notice the peace of God come into your life beyond all understanding, beyond any reason you have peace because you know that God is not a man that he would lie, that he is faithful to his word, that you are a child in him. Watch the people come to you and ask what's different about you. Not to give you glory, don't mistake mistake me, but so that you can direct the honor and the glory back to God, watch their lives be changed, amen? I see the people in this room, you guys are bold in faith. You guys are hungry. I know that you will walk out of here and make the decision to do what the word of God says regarding your promises. I know it. I'm so excited to hear the testimonies. I'm so excited to see the victory that you're gonna walk in simply because you chose to take your money to the bank on the word of God rather than your circumstances. Let's pray together. Let me pray for you. 
Father, I thank you that you've given us You've given us your word that we understand what's legally ours when we've accepted Christ into our lives. Father, we know the first thing is that we are saved. That's the greatest miracle of all, that a sinner would become saved, that someone would turn their heart toward God the Father and accept the truth that Jesus Christ came to this earth so that he could die, be raised on the, uh, rise again, so that we could be united with you again, God, reconciled, redeemed, We're no longer slaves to sin. Galatians 4, 7, God, we are your children. We cry, Abba, Father, because you have looked at us as your children. God, I declare every single person in this room who needs healing over their body would look to your word and understand the truth that says we are already healed because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. God, it is not something we beg and plead for. It is already legally ours. Show them what it means to face the giants of fear, of doubt, of anxiety, to boldly come against them and say, you are no match for my God. Greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. I will speak what is not as though it is. And even though it doesn't look like I have victory in the natural, I know that not because of my works, not because of what I do, but because of who I am in Christ, that victory is mine in Jesus' name. I thank you for a bold faith to arise in this place. A bold faith of Joshua and Caleb who will walk out of here, depend on your power and go and conquer those things. Face the giants and proclaim that God gets the glory every time. God, I pray for the group of people who don't even know how they'll muster up the strength to even take a step so that the soles of their feet can tread on new ground. I thank you. You give them a word right now in Jesus' name. You speak to them in a way that only you can, Holy Spirit. Scripture says you guide us, Holy Spirit. You speak to us. You're our teacher. You're our friend. I thank you, God, for hope, for faith in areas that there's not been faith. Now I pray for the group of people. You guys can keep your heads in your uh, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. But there's a group of people in here, and you've not given your life to Christ. You've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've done it in the past, but you've fallen away. Do you know what the Bible says concerning you, your life? It is God's will that everyone would be saved. Man, that Jesus loved you so much, so much that He died on the cross that we would receive salvation and and the power under the blood of Christ. The Bible says that, the Bible says that there's eternity written on everybody's heart. And what that means is that everybody desires something. There's a God-shaped hole that we all have, a desire to know the something greater, whatever that is, and we know that he's God. And that that very God sent his son Jesus on the cross to die for your sins, to forgive you on this earth, but that you would spend eternity in heaven with him and that for the rest of your life here on earth, you would walk into the promise that God has given you. You would be sons and daughters. You would have peace that passes all understanding. And then when you die, you will spend eternity in heaven with God. Now the scripture also says that to make that happen, you're to pray a prayer that believes in your heart and speaks with your mouth, all of these things. But the moment that you believe it and speak it, a miracle happens. You get saved. The Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of you and Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you've never been saved and you wanna get saved for the very first time today or you wanna rededicate your life to Christ, we're gonna pray a prayer, but I would really love to see everybody who's making that decision. If you wanna get saved, either for the first time or or rededicate your life, then if you'll put your hand real high where I can see it really high. I knew it. Hands all over the place. Hands all over the place. God is moving. (laughs) God, you're so good. We're going to say a prayer together and everybody's going to repeat after me. And you know that you have a family. You have a, a whole boatload of people who support you and are excited for this decision. So you guys repeat after me. Father God, I believe in the word. I thank you that because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross and he rose again in power 
that I might be made right with you. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Save me right now. Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. From this moment forward, I am surrendered to you. I live by your word and I will spend eternity in heaven. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the best miracle is when someone gets saved. Let's give it up for all those who did today.